Okay, so hi everyone. Uh, my name is Denis Boudreau. I work for DQ System. Well, actually, no, I'm not supposed to say that. <laughs> Sorry, scratch that. I'm not supposed to say it. Um, I uh, am a consultant working in web accessibility today. Um, and I'm here to talk about PDF uh, testing. Not remediation, not creation of content really, but um, helping you figure out a way to test whether or not the documents that you are being delivered are indeed accessible when it comes to PDF. So the, the whole idea of this presentation is that for most people that I meet, they don't really know how to do that. So they might work with vendors who will create PDF documents for them. They might have people internally that create PDF documents for them. And those people might tell them that documents are accessible, but they would have no way of actually knowing or verifying that. So for a lot of people, this can be very stressful because they have to answer to other people regarding the work that's been done, and they don't really have a way to measure that. So I figured that an interesting presentation, a useful presentation, would be to give people that fit that profile some tools, so like self-defense techniques uh, against PDF accessibility. So it would be easier to determine whether or not the document actually is accessible. So this is what we're going to do in the next 45 minutes or so. I am presenting the whole thing directly in a PDF document because I figured if I'm going to talk about these things, I might as well show you what I'm talking about as I'm doing this. So we'll be switching back and forth inside Acrobat to, uh, to look at the different options that we can use there to verify accessibility. So I'm assuming that if you're responsible or accountable for PDF accessibility, you will at least have that tool available to you. There would be other tools obviously we could talk, with, uh, talk about. But uh, to keep things rather simple, um, let's pretend that this is the one we want to use. And I'll have a slide at some point showing you other options as well. So my first question is this. Basically, uh, when you ask people how they actually deal with PDF, most of them uh, recognize that it's pretty much a losing battle. So they don't really know what to do. They don't really know what they're supposed to check for. All they know is that ultimately, if they provide answers that are actually wrong, they could be in trouble. But they have no real ways to measure that. So that's what we want to try and answer today. And then when we talk about the strategy that people have uh, with PDF accessibility, so for those who can't see the screen, uh, what we have is a gentleman wearing a suit with his, uh, his head buried in the sand. So and this, the slide title says, what's your strategy about PDF accessibility? So for a lot of people, that's what it is. So they're, they're, it's wishful thinking. They hope that everything is fine, but they don't really have a way to measure that. And then when you start talking about the things that are uh, required, for a lot of people, it just makes no sense. So for, for most of the, the people that we work with, at some point, it's just way easier to just uh, end the, the responsibility over to somebody else and just hope that everything is fine. So uh, so on the screen, what we have is a bunch of people raising their hand with concerned looks on their faces because we just asked them whether or not they knew what to do with that. And pretty much nobody knows. Or nobody seems pretty thrilled about the whole thing anyway. So when we talk about PDF documents, and we see that on, on discussion lists very often, where um, somebody asks a question about PDF and how to make it accessible, and then... I'd say like 99% of the time, somebody will just answer something like, use HTML instead, PDF is crap. PDF sucks, don't use PDF, do something else, blah, blah, blah. So we've, we've heard all those comments before, and we will do that again, obviously. And no matter how often we read those comments, whether sometimes it's, uh, it's like, don't use PDF, use HTML, semantic HTML instead. So no matter how often we hear those comments, or any other comment for that matter that would be quite hateful, versus or against the format itself, um, it pretty, comes down, pretty much comes down to the same thing, which is haters are going to hate. So it, it's, it turns out that at the beginning of, of, of my, my journey in PDF accessibility, I can probably call it a journey, um, the whole thing was very problematic because every time you were trying to figure out what to do, there would be people just bashing on it, and, and that's not very constructive. But it turns out that it's actually quite entertaining also. Because it turns out it's pretty much always the same people that do this. And they usually bash on PDF because they have other solutions that they want to push instead. So once you realize and start sorting the different people, what it comes down to basically is we don't really care what you think. PDF documents are there. They're not going to go away. We need to deal with them. We need to learn how to actually use them, measure them, 
make them accessible and deal with the fact that they, they're, they're, they exist, that they're there for a while. There could be discussions whether or not PDFs are going to go away because of EPUB or whatever other technology, but it would be as pointless as wondering whether or not Flash will be there or HTML will be there in the long run. So we don't really care. Today, we have millions of documents that we need to deal with, and we need to know how to do that. So basically, if you guys are saying PDFs suck, we don't care. That's what I'm trying to say. So measuring PDF accessibility. The idea is learning basic PDF accessibility self-defense techniques. Um, and when you start thinking about this a little bit, it's very much like testing for HTML content in a lot of ways. First of all, it's based on the same requirements, so we know um, if we, I mean, if we know about uh, the web content accessibility guidelines, if we know about the techniques for web content accessibility guidelines, we're already on, on our way to understanding pretty much what needs to be done. We might not know how to do it, but we understand that if we're concerned with images being accessible or not, it's pretty much the same idea. You have an image in a document, you want to make sure that you have an alternative for it. If you have uh, uh, content in your, di in your PDF that looks like a heading, you want to make sure that it's marked up appropriately so that the semantic is conveyed to a screen reader user also. So when once you realize that, it becomes a little less daunting, I think, to know that you could actually probably do something like this if you have at least a minimum of, of technical skills. So, but still for a lot of people, it still, it still doesn't resonate that much. So it's okay to be clueless or feel clueless if you, if you don't know how to do that. But the idea of what we're going to talk now is about making you a little less clueless about these things and providing you with techniques or, 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 or tool, tools that would uh, allow you to make it a little easier. So we know about web content accessibility guidelines. I'm really not going to go there and talk about this. I'm assuming that everybody at least has heard about it before. If you haven't, then the slides are available. You can go and read that if you want to. It, again, it, this may seem daunting, but the whole thing is like 17 page, pages when printed, so it's not that hard. And then another 17 for def definitions afterwards. So if you really want to read the essence of it, it's pretty, probably done within an hour. So nothing really complicated there. And I talked also about techniques for, for, uh, for web content accessibility guidelines. Among those techniques, there are techniques for PDF accessibility specifically, meaning that if we're concerned about the ability to uh, to make, say, uh, running headers and footers in a document accessible, well, it so happens that there's a technique that talks about this and explains you how to do that. So if you're willing to read through those documents, you can find most of those answers in there. And it so happens also that you, pr you will find examples on how to do these things within those documents. So of course, not everybody is willing to spend hours reading this stuff. It would be much more easy if somebody chewed it up for them and gave it gave them something like this here, which is what we're doing now. So breaking news, not everybody's a PDF expert. Um, another shocking uh, truth is that nobody has, no, not everyone has access to one either. So there are folks in this room, for instance, that are very good at doing PDF accessibility and they are being visible through this, con this, the, this uh, conference. Uh, namely Accessible IT, who's one of the sponsors here. So there are people that can do this for you. But at the same time, you may not have the budget to call on them every single time that you need something, and your managers probably expect you to be a little more autonomous than that, on at least on simple things. And um, when we talk about PDF accessibility outside of those groups, it turns out that it's actually easier to find an, a really good movie with uh, Nicolas Cage in it than actually finding a PDF expert that actually knows what he's talking about. So, uh, and for those of you who haven't seen The Wicker Man, don't. <laughs> it, it's really bad. But again, so are most of the people that pretend to be uh, accessibility experts in, in, when it comes to PDF. And I'm really not one either. I just happen to understand a few things. I understand enough to know that when something is complicated, you should really go and, and, and seek uh, expert advice on these things. But just like for, for accessibility in general, it turns out that if you understand the basics, there's quite a lot you can do yourself because before you actually need to go to somebody. And I'm all about teaching the ability to be, teaching you how to fish, basically, rather than giving you that fish every single time. So I'm hoping that by going through these things, we can at least put some, some basic um, uh, skills or, or reflexes in place, so you can at least go somewhere, uh, meet, meet, your, meet your, your consultants at least halfway. 
So having said all this, proposal for the rest of us, or, I like, or how I like to put it, how to fake your way into looking like a PDF expert in 15 easy steps. So you can imagine that we'll be going through 15 steps as of now. So before we do that, uh, I talked about tools that I wanted to uh, at least have you aware of. So obviously, uh, Adobe Acrobat Pro uh, version 10 or 11 wouldn't make much of a difference for what we're doing. Um, as long as you can afford it, pretty convenient um, tool to do that. There's Common Look PDF also, which is a plugin that you can use if you're, if you're running Windows that I'm actually testing and turns out to be quite good also. And then there's PDF Accessibility Checker. If you can't afford any of those things and you still want to have something to test for, then you can do some of that testing with, uh, with Pack 2, so PDF Accessibility Checker 2, or 1, because they just changed recently the version. So those tools exist. I'm not affiliated in any way with any of them, like it says up there, so no financial interest, but it turns out that they're pretty good tools, especially if you don't really know what to do with the whole thing. And then there's screen readers. So people will tell you that if you're, not, if you're not testing your content with screen reader, then you're not really doing the right thing. But it turns out that most people that I know have never actually tried using a screen reader. So even though everybody's, so even though it's the cool thing to say that, yeah, we're using a screen reader for most people when they're saying this, they're a little, can I say bullshit? Can I say bullshit? They're, they're bullshitting you most of the time because they don't really use a screen reader. They might have tried it once or twice, but for most people, they don't go to that extent because they don't really need to do that. So nobody really wants to learn that stuff either if it's not their job in the first place. I would expect somebody who works in the, the accessibility business to be familiar with these tools, but I wouldn't expect somebody who has the responsibility of making sure that accessibility is handled properly in their organization while doing so many other different things and then still learn about NVDA or JAWS or VoiceOver or whatnot. So even though it would be very useful to use a screen reader, what I'm talking about here does not really include the ability to use the screen reader because I think it's a little more advanced than what we need to address in the first place. So the first thing we want to do when we open up a document is make sure that the document is actually made of text rather than images. So that's actually very simple. If we want to do that, uh, the first thing that you could do would simply be to select all the content from a document and see whether or not something is actually selected. So if I take a document like this one and I simply... Uh, select my content, then I know that it's there. So something as simple as this can be done by just about anybody. So whether you, 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 control, you control the whole the whole content or you just select it manually like this, it tells you that the content that's there is actually content in text. So you know that the whole thing can be searched, it can be indexed, it can be, if you're looking for something into that document, you will find it easily. So that's the very first thing you want to make sure uh, that you have in the documents that are given to you. And then if those documents aren't made of, uh, are of text but are rather made of images, then we, uh, in most cases, what I, would, what I would argue would be that you shouldn't even try to work any further and just send a document back to whoever gave it to you saying, well, that your document is not accessible. So that would be your first step, unless actually they, uh, they, they went through the, the effort of recreating all the content of that document into alt texts for each of those images but it's rather unlikely. So if they haven't gone through the effort of creating a document in text, I would doubt that they went through the effort of creating the whole thing as an alternate version underneath in text also. So chances are it really isn't. Um, so your best option would be to just say, go back to your, to your, to your workstation and, and start over again. So part of this is making sure that, uh, that it's, it's text-based. And then uh, you might also want to check for a few things that we'll check right after, like uh, access restrictions, default language identification, and document title. So basic things, again, that would allow you to understand what the document is, what it's about, and, and basically if you can, if, if this is the document that you're actually looking for. Because if you have a few documents open, say, we, say you're using your, uh, your uh, screen reader user, and you have a few PDF documents open, and you're tabbing from one to another, it's kind of nice to hear the title of the document and have that title be descriptive and, and meaningful rather than just in a series of numbers and letters that don't mean anything. So you can easily locate or determine whether or not you have the right document in front of you. So it's basic things like that. Or making sure that the same document, when you open it with your screen reader, that it actually reads that document into the proper language because it's been identified as English or French or Spanish. So very simple things that we can check, and this is, these are the first thing that we'll be looking at uh, when, uh, as we go through this. 
So the, the, the 15 different um, tests that we want to do, <clears throat> and maybe not do all of them, but at least do some of them, if you, if you end up using that, that grid, uh, are related to access restriction, default language, document title, bookmarks, content reflow, read out loud, uh, tag structure, semantic structure, tabbing order, infor informational images, decorative images, meaningful hyperlinks, uh, page numbering, ta data tables, and form fields. So, and for each of those things, it happens that we can relate that to some of the success criteria from WCAG 2. So if you're, again, if you're familiar with WCAG 2 a little bit, you would know that when we talk about, say, um, a document title, then it relates to a specific success criterion, which is 2.4.2 about page title. So it, it relates directly to that. And we have a technique <clears throat> in the techniques for PDF called PDF 18, which explains you how you would do that thing. So using a grid like this one makes it quite easy for you to just start with this and then uh, check things that are good or, or missing and then bring that back to, uh, to whoever you're working with saying you've missed out on those things. So even if you're not an expert, you can at least have a grid like this and cover some of the things that, are, that, that I feel are much easier to, to, uh, to control uh, when it comes to PDF accessibility. <clears throat> so the first of those techniques would be uh, about access restrictions. So basically the idea is that um, you want to make sure the document is not secure in any way because sometimes when it is, it has security features uh, turned on in, on that document, then it becomes impossible for a screen reader to read it. So it's improved a lot in the, in the past few years uh, since I, I don't remember which version, but since a, a while ago. But even then, what we want to make sure and what you can do is simply open up the document properties from uh, Acrobat go to security, one of the tabs there, and if it happens that you have security set to the document, make sure that the option at the bottom here, which you probably can't read, uh, that says enable text access for screen reader devices for the visually impaired is actually checked. So it will open up, open that gateway for the screen reader to be able to actually read the document even though it is secured. So the idea of having a document that, is, that has security on it is not a problem in itself as long as we also have that checkbox checked. So that would be the first thing we would try to do if we wanted to see if the document was accessible. And it has nothing to do in that case with the, the images being described or anything. It's really simple access. Is that door locked or can I actually open it and, and go into that document? And then we're talking about default language. So going back to uh, document properties again. So I'm, I'm hitting command D in my case, but it would be control D on, a, on Windows platform. So it's very easy access to that. Uh, that uh, window, which you can also access by going, um, where I forget, uh, properties here. So going to properties, then we, we, and we're talking about default language here. So going to uh, that tab, advanced, advanced tab, we want to make sure that the language has been set for the document. So again, very simple to test for. Might be a little more complicated if you wanted to do that, if you didn't know what, how to do that or how to, where to start. But if you just want to make sure that it's been set in either English or French, all you have to do is open up the properties and go check the last tab to see if, it's, if there's something in there or if the right language is in there. Because often what will happen, especially um, in, in, in a city like Toronto where you're dealing with both languages on a rather regular basis, it happens very often, the docu document will be created in one language, then translated to the other, and then we forget about the language setting. So even though the whole thing would be in French, it would be read as if it was an English document. And believe me, when I use NVDA set in French on an English document, it is quite entertaining. So they're not very uh, easy to understand. So again, something very simple here that we can check without having any specific knowledge about accessibility. And then document title is another one of those. Again, by going to the document properties, what we can do is go to, well, first go to description and make sure that we have a title in there. So in this case here, measuring PDF accessibility, PDF uh, A11Y testing for the rest of us, A11Y CAM TO 2013. So we set a title for the document. And then going to initial view, we make sure that instead of showing the file name, it actually shows the document title. So whenever I switch or tab from one document to another and I get back to this one, Instead of having a file name that may mean nothing to me, it's going to read what we see at the very top of it up there. So the whole title, and then my name in this case. So again, nothing complicated, but very 
basic things that we can check for. And then we're talking about bookmarks. So bookmarks are another thing. Uh, so so you, you guys are probably familiar with the idea of navigating through a document, document using headings. So uh, going through H1s, H2s, and so on. So we have the same, the same type of structure in PDF. Just, just in, in case nobody knows about it, some people don't know about this. There is markup behind a PDF document just like there is markup behind an HTML document. So there's a structure uh, underneath that we can actually use to navigate through the document. So if we have titles or, or headings on that page, then we can go through uh, the tag structure and actually navigate from one heading to another in that document. So we'll get to that a little later. But before we do, we can also make sure that the document has bookmarks in them. So basically bookmarks would be like, if you took like a, well in this case, see I, my bookmarks are slides. So I can go, I can jump from one slide to another because I, that's how I built my, my bookmarks in this case. But my bookmarks could have been built in any other way using any of the, the other markup that I have in that document. So what I could do would be to completely delete what I have in there. So now I wouldn't have any bookmarks anymore. And if I wanted to create that, then I would just create bookmarks from structure. And then I could use whatever I have in here. So I'm seeing a figure H1, H2, L, L, B, L, and so on. And then I happen to have one that's called slide. Press OK. Give it a name, whatever that is. And then they're all there. Easily as that. So I could, well, actually, I'm going to go back because I don't want to spoil anything. But if I wanted to go back, jump back to slide three, for instance, that's all I need to do. So I can jump very easily from one slide to another or from one section of the document to another using those bookmarks. So having said that, let's go back to where we were. So then content reflow. Content reflow is an interesting thing because I really don't control it yet. So this is where I show you that I don't really know everything that I'm talking about here. So the idea of content reflow is that if you're a low vision user, you can uh, reorganize the flow of the document so it's actually easier for you to read. So instead of having everything laid out like it is on the screen here, what we can do instead is reorganize the whole thing into a single column with the text being much easier to read because it doesn't interfere with everything else. So because I suck really bad, I'm really bad at PowerPoint, uh, the way that I built it isn't that great to begin with. So I have to do a lot of work in PowerPoint, in PDF afterwards to remediate that. So one of the things that I haven't figured out yet, admittedly, is how to do that so it works. So I'm not going to do it now because I know that if I do it, then I break my PDF and I can't continue this presentation, so that would be bad. But if you want me to do it at the end of the presentation, then I can do that and we can see actually what happens when, we, when, when you do it wrong. But the idea basically here is that, again, if you wanted to test this, all you have to do is go into the view menu, go to, uh, where is it, zoom, and then select reflow. And then it will just get rid of background images and stuff and give you just the content that you need to read. So it's a very interesting way or efficient way to make sure that none of the content in your document is, is actually part of a background image and not being described. So if you lose content when you do this, you have a very good indication that there is a problem. And like I said, we have this problem here. So I'm not doing that now. But you get the idea. And then read out loud is another interesting feature where if you don't have a screen reader, if you don't know how to use one, if you don't want to use one, then you could at least uh, try a little bit to see how it turns out if you, if, you, if you had that document read to you. So again, by going to uh, view, read out loud, activating read out loud, and then starting it, say read this page only for instance. So I'm not, I don't know if you're going to hear it well, but It worked before, of course. But the idea, so I don't know why it's not working, um, but anyway. Um, so by doing this, basically, you either read the page or you read the document or you read the section of the document, depending on what you chose. And it will read the whole thing to you so you know if, you're, if, if all your content is being, uh, is being, be, being read or, or perceived by the software, which would be a nice indication if the same content would be perceived or by, by a screen reader which would need that to convey it to a user. So if you don't, if you have a barrier there already, then you know that something is wrong with that with the document. Right. 
promise you it is working. Okay, so uh, semantic structure. So starting from this one, instead of going through the features of Acrobat, what we're going to start doing is actually going through that structure. So the equivalent pretty much of the DOM uh, if we were into an HTML document. So like I said, there are tags in, in PDF, that's just like there are tags in, in HTML. So we can look at that structure and see what we have there. So again, when I built it, I marked each of those sections as slides because it's much more convenient to work that way. So uh, at least that's, that's how I see it. So going to say uh, slide 31, if I open that, then I'll find that inside that structure, I have a H1 for semantic structure, which would be my main heading for the page. Then a H2 for what we have on top there, so always content organized consistently using semantically incorrectly structured tags or markup. Then I, then I have a list, in this case, of only one element, and then the whole thing would be read to me. So when, say, NVDA gets to documents like this, what it finds in that specific page would be a H1, a H2, a list, and then uh, an image, because I've also described the figure, so the, the background image, I described that, and in that case, I described it as being step number seven in that process of testing for 15 different things. So the, the screen reader would be reading these things uh, one after the other, in the order that you uh, that you you assign to it, so um, and interestingly enough, and that's the part where I don't really recommend that you do that. But you can also look at the whole document through not the markup itself, but the order in which things are being presented. So when you when you jump to um, <coughs> sorry, when you jump to the order uh, tab of, of Acrobat, then you can know. You can see from the numbers next to each box the order in which things are going to be read. So if that order order doesn't doesn't feel right for you, then you can go in here. So for instance, if I went to this here, I could go and start switching them around if I wanted, say, semantic structure to be read before the image, before the image. So the interesting thing here, and this is where I start breaking my document, is that sometimes when you do this and you change things around, some stuff disappears because you you take the image and you turn it, you, you change its its layer, so things become under the image, and then you obviously don't want that because then you, you lose your content. So this is not something that you can easily work with. And again, admittedly, it's probably because my structure in PowerPoint isn't that great, but it's one of the shortcomings that at least I, I'm dealing with at the moment when I'm exploring these things. So it's not really, it's not really easy to play with this at the moment, and it, it will probably be improved over time in Acrobat and other, in other solutions as well. But at least, again, from the perspective of somebody who's actually just testing this, this stuff, if you see a document and you realize that the, the order of the content, because we're talking about reading order here, basically, so that's another success criterion that's really important in WCAG 2. So we're talking about uh, success criterion 1.3.2 in this case. We want to make sure that that structure, that, that order of content makes sense. So we don't want things to be read in the wrong order because then we lose some of the meaning of the content uh, directly. So you can just go into that uh, that element, that, that that I mean, and then determine whether the order is se seems to be an, an order that's logical. That's all you really need to do. If you realize that it's not there, then you can just uh, cross that one as being as being a problem, and you bring it back to your 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 author or vendor or whatever so they can fix it. So that was for number seven. So now, as you see, I lost my content on that slide. So hopefully, we don't need, we don't need that anymore. But uh, it's, it's very easy. When you start playing into, into, the, into the tags, when you're not experienced, like some of the folks here are, uh, it's pretty easy to break what you're working with. So you need to be careful. So, so the idea of actually saving your document every, like I used to save it, like every action that I would do, I would save a copy just to make sure because you can't really go back, you don't have any, any undo functionality in, in Acrobat, for instance. So if you break something, you're done. So you, hopefully you have a version that's not too old when you, when you break something. But that being said, we don't really mind about this at the moment because we're not actually remediating stuff, we're just trying to see whether or not it's accessible. So tabbing order, uh, in this case, is just as easy as testing for tabbing order on an on HTML page. What you want to do is basically use your tabulation key on your keyboard and go from one active element to another and see whether or not that order makes sense. So the tabbing order is logical. It goes where you expect it to go. It's not jumping on one side or another uh, in, in an order that seems very random. So without doing anything specific, but simply just 
tabbing through the document through those those links or those form controls, for instance, then you can see whether or not there's something that seems to be broken there. And again, if you saw something, you could always re report that as being something that sounds like the, seems like there's a problem. Then informational images. So, so the whole idea about images, and we'll talk about decorative images afterwards, but but the idea, as you know, is to describe images, de describe non-text content in text. That's the, the general idea. So when you when we talk about informational images, we're talking about images that actually convey some information to the content itself. So we want those to be described, as opposed to decorative images that we'll talk after, where they're just there to make the document look nicer, or, or they serve a specific purpose that doesn't convey anything specific in terms of information. So we don't really want those to be, to be, to be conveyed because they're more, more noise than anything else. So when we talked about informational images, then what we really need to do is make sure that those images are, um, are described in text. So one of the ways we could do that would be to, let's just close that one for a second. So use the touch up reading order tool and then see whether or not images have text assigned to them. So whenever we see a figure, we want to see if there's something beside it. So in this case, step 09. So that would, that would be my indication that there's actually indeed some, some text that describes that image. So whether or not we want that description to be something like uh, step nine in this case, or we want a description of the, Im the image itself, including the measuring tape that's there, that's another story completely. So you determine whether or not it's, in case it's relevant to describe everything in that image or not. But the idea of actually describing the image is, is, is as simple as, uh, so going back to this, and then, so I'm not going too quickly, so going to the, the number one in this case, because that's what describes the image, right click on that, and then edit alternate text, and just add something in there. That's really what you need to do. Or if you wanna be a little more audacious, you could also do something like this, where, so let me decide to make three now. So going to the figure, and then going to the properties of the document, the, the document itself, and set it as alternate text. Same thing. So you can describe some of, the, some of those images to make sure that they're actually described in text. So again, if you have access to Acrobat, all you need to do is know that you can click right-click on the image, set, go to properties, and see whether or not it's been described. It's really all you need to do at, the, at that level. So next one would be decorative images. There. So in that case, it's images we don't want to hear about for whatever reason. So whenever we do that, what we would be doing would simply be to, again, go back to the uh, touch up reading order tool. And whenever there's an image that we don't want, we can select it and then turn it into a background image using the, that button there in the touch up reading, uh, reading order dialog box. So if I do that, then the image becomes uh, it's still it's still displayed on the screen because it's still part of the of the layout of the document, but it's not part of my markup anymore. So there are other things we can we need to yeah. No, not really. Uh, it would. It can. Okay. So so maybe in in some cases it could. Um, or, or, or in some cases it does, that's what I should say, because you obviously know more than, about that than me. But in a, in a case like this one, what it will do, it, it remains as part of, of, the, of the visual that you have, but it's just not part of that structure anymore. So that's, that's the whole idea. Basically like having an image in HTML, using the, putting that image into CSS rather than HTML, so even if you wanted to describe it at that point, you can't because there's no way to actually describe something that's in the background. So that's the same idea. So I, I've never really run into a problem where assigning something to a as a background or as an artifact, which is the proper term for this, uh, created an issue where you lost that content. But I have no trouble imagining that for the same reason that when you start playing with your layers, you lose some of that stuff, you could happen to do that there as well. But I've never really seen it. So I don't really know. Um, so uh, that was for, for number uh, 10. Going, okay. So going to uh, eleven. So we're talking about meaningful hyperlinks. So again, just like in HTML, where we have a success criterion that's intended to make sure that uh, that hyperlinks are meaningful and, and 
describe the, the either the link or the purpose of the link, we want to make sure that we have the same thing in PDF. So whenever you have a link in your document, uh, you need to think about what it says and make sure that it's meaningful, that it describes whatever it's going to lead to or the purpose or whatever else. So if there's anything that doesn't seem right there, again, you don't need to have any technical skills to be able to tell you your, your vendor or your author. Uh, while you're using click here a certain number of places, it would be much better if you if you worked on, on the copy and changed that to something else. So you don't really need to know any of the technical details to just be able to flag those things when you see them. So when you have a lot of more info or, or read more or click here or even other links that seem to be uh, rather significant within their context, sometimes they're not going to be taken in their in that context. So if you have a, if you have a link like that says something like, well, click here to download this document and only click here is here, it is true that programmatically the screen reader will be able to say what it, this is about because it's it's related to a very specific object, which would be the, the sentence in which it is. But if you want to be a little nicer to your users, you will avoid that anyway. So for a lot of people who have, so let's say AODA, perfect example here. So AODA requires everyone to be accessible on level A for, for next January. So what that means that for, um, for meaningful hyperlinks, all you need to do is make sure that those links are meaningful within their immediate context. Immediate programmatically determinable context. So the same sentence, the same block of element, or whatever. But if you want to go a little further and make sure that people don't have any difficulty understanding what you're talking about, then making sure that you rewrite that, even though that would that would be uh, that would be, be um, would fall under another level of, of conformance, you can still go a little further and actually do that anyway, which which a lot of people are doing really because they see they see the value of just working with the with the content differently and make it more accessible that way. So then we're talking about page numbering, so. In a lot of documents, what happens is when you look at the, the the page numbering in the document itself, and then the value that you have on top in in the in the interface of Acrobat, for instance, those numbers might be different. Might be different because your document has five or six pages at the beginning that don't have numbering on them because then they're not the not where the real content start, or maybe they start by letters before going to numbers. So very often, what happens is. You know by your document that you're on page 54, but really what, what uh, Acrobat is saying is that you're on page 62, for instance. So if you're, if you're trying to work with somebody who has a disability and can't see the document, and you tell them that you're on page 62 when you're really on page 53, then there's confusion there. So you can avoid that very easily by making sure that your page numbering actually matches the one that's really there. So instead of set, talking about the number of the document itself, make sure that it's really the number of the, in this case, the slide, or, or the document, or the, the, the page of the document, really. So making sure that they match uh, actually improves, again, accessibility and avoids uh, confu potential confusion for, for many people. And then running headers and footers. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. So we want to make sure that there's consistency again. So, so there, there, uh, there could be a lot of things that we talk about this. We would want to make sure that um, running headers and footers, so the stuff that we have on, on top or at the bottom of a document, when they repeat on every page, that they're not really read every single time you encounter them when you go to a document. You want to read them the first time, you want to read them the la at the, on the last page maybe, but you really don't need to be reminded at the end of every page that you're having a document that talks about these things. So you can control that, but what I'm talking about here really is making sure that if you have those headers, you want to be uh, sure that they're they're matching the content of that actual page because what often happens is that we forget to update the, the, the content of the header or the, the footer in for a specific page and it still has the information from the previous section instead of having the information from this section. So nothing really to do with uh, with, with with technically making the document more accessible but everything to do with the experience that you're providing and making sure that there are no errors in there. So something that you can check very easily again. Um, and then not pretty good on time. So um, talking about tables, so uh, same thing here. When If, if you're familiar with HTML, uh, then you know about the table structure. So table element, a TR for the rows, TH for table headers, TD for table data cells. So we have the exact same thing in PDF. So we could go to very quickly, because I'm pretending like I have a lot of time, but I don't. So going to uh, slide 24. If I went into that structure again, I can find all the structure of that table. So wh whatever I choose here, 
will be highlighted on the right. So if I go to a specific row, I can open that row, make sure that I'm going through each of them. And in this case, I expect them to be table headers because they're obviously headers for that table. So they're tagged, they're marked up as TH. If I went to the next one, and the first one would be marked up as in a header also because I feel that this is a header for the the, the row instance. So the, there were columns before, now I'm talking about rows. So excess restriction is a TH. And then the other two would simply be data table, uh, data cells instead. So simple TD uh, like we have in HTML. So you could do that the hard way, which would be coding it like this by hand, one by one. Or if you're lucky enough, you can again use the shepherding order tool and for a specific table, go to the table editor and see what structure you get there. So visually, you can see r right there that what is a TH, what is a TD, if, you're, if it's broken in any way. So without even having to look at the HTML code, I mean the PDF markup in this case, you can know if, if you understand the idea of TH versus TD, you can do that very easily. So very simple, you can easily flag if, if there's a problem without actually having to go through the pain of, of looking at it really. So uh, so that was number 14, and then number 15 to finish. So form fields. So in HTML, um, creating accessible forms is a little more complicated because what you have to do is make sure that you create pro the proper association between a, for a, text, uh, a text label and a form control, uh, whether you're using the label attribute with the for, uh, the, with, I mean the, the, the label element with the for attribute with a matching ID attribute for the, the input itself is one way. Uh, you could do that using ARIA. You could do that in many different other ways. When it comes to PDF, really, what the only thing you need to be concerned about is making sure that for a specific uh, text field, you have the equivalent of a tooltip assigned to it. So pretty much like doing, if you're familiar with HTML, using a title attribute on each of the fields of a form. Of a, of a form. So if you do only that much, if you check only for that much, then you uh, you can you can see whether or not when somebody gets to a specific field, if the screen reader is going to tell them what that field is about, and if the information that they're going to be conveyed be conveyed to them makes uh, makes sense. So if it's the right information, so maybe we forgot something, maybe there, there was a mistake, and it's very easy to to lose sight of these things because they're all in the code under underneath, so you never see it afterwards. So making sure that it's there will help because, um, but well, that's not exactly true. I mean, you could go into uh, into the I think it's content. I'm not sure. I forget. Um, yeah, somewhere around here. You could you could do it the, the more complicated way where you create the field and then you associate information with it and create that association. But again, very very complicated. If all you need to do is make sure that there's a label assigned to it, you go to that field, you click on properties, you get that information into the equivalent of a tooltip, and then you know if if something is associated with it. And I, I feel like. For, well, for people that just need to make sure that it is somewhat accessible, then doing that test will will reveal if there is a problem or not. So that would be enough for somebody who really wasn't uh, an expert to begin with, but just needed to be able to to understand these things. So that's it, basically. So the idea, again, is if you understand the idea that this is not very different from testing HTML content, then it becomes a little much less daunting. And if you understand WCAG, if you know WCAG, then you already know what to do in these cases. Because if I tell you about images, you already know what to do with those. So the same thing applies in the context of, of PDF content. So it's a light at the end of the tunnel, maybe. Hopefully it is. So get out there, document the issues, send them to, uh, to whoever you're working with, get on a more equi uh, equal level with them, so because basically, and I, I would know because I'm on that side of the of the equation. But we often come into into a relation a relationship with clients where we know that we're holding the bigger side of the bigger end of the stick because we understand the technology they don't. So it's easy for us. It would be easy for us, and I guess people some people are doing that. But it's easy for us to just say whatever we feel is the right thing to say because it helps us. But when we give you tools like this, then we don't have that power over you that much anymore. So it's much more of an, of a, of an equal uh, conversation, and I like that very much. So hopefully you can use stuff like that to do this with PDF. So keep calm, I get PDF, show them who's the boss here, and you can do it. That's it. So that's it for me. Merci beaucoup, and uh, have a great lunch, because I know I'm already 
three minutes out on my time. So any questions if you have? Otherwise, I, oh, yeah. Um, well, there are a lot of things that I could have talked about. When I, when I built our methodology for PDF, I ended up with 35 or 36 different things that we're checking for. So obviously, I'm not considering them all here. Uh, when it comes to PDF, uh, for, I mean to contrast, um, if I had a problem with contrast in the document, I would just go back, I would try to go back to the source and change that information there because I don't really think that you can change anything once it's in PDF. So the problem would be having a format that is that is closed at that at that point, so you can't really change anything anymore. But the idea would be to it would be the same thing as in HTML, where you do your you do your you use your your um, your your color picker, and then you make sure that the the, the contrast rate the the luminosity contrast ratio is is sufficient, so it it, it passes either uh, four point five to one or three to one depending on on what you're you're doing. But yeah, so things like uh, like color contrast, things like um, of course I'm not going to think of any of the others. But there are other things that that could have been included in there. I like 15 for some weird reason, and it almost fits into 45 minutes. So uh, so that's why I pretty much have that number. Uh, but yeah, and you're right. I mean, the the last time I did the presentation, I had one on semantic structure and I had one on headings. I merged the two so I could fit in read out loud this time, which was a really bad idea because it didn't work. But uh, the idea is that depending on how I feel, I pretty much pick some of those, and, and that's what I use for for that presentation. But yeah, there could be there there is other things to check, obviously more besides what I've shown here today. Any other question? Yep. Well, no. <laughs> yeah. Well, honestly, the answer is yes, but it's so difficult that I would say no. I mean, even in HTML, the more complicated your table is, then the more difficult it is to actually do it in HTML also. So it's not it's not it's not much easier in whether whatever the technology you're using. Um, when you have and depending, it's it's always a question of of the source that you're actually working with. So if your source is really well organized to begin with. The conversion to PDF is likely to give you something that is pr hopefully okay, and then you can go back into the, stru the, the, the the text structure and change it there manually if you want to, because it's it's actually very easy. If you want to, if you want to change anything in there, all you need to do, say I'm not happy with that being a TR, I change that into a PD, even if that makes no sense, and then it's going to be considered a TD afterwards. So it's going to be broken because I'm talking about a row in this case. So I should have taken the other one underneath. But you can change anything to anything. So if I wanted that to be, so say if I, if I put it back into a TR, and I wanted this to be a simple paragraph, that's really all I need to do, and it's a paragraph now. So whatever we have visually on the screen, we can convey as something else for the screen reader uh, because we, we determined that this, the actual semantic structure behind is whatever whatever else we want it to be. So. The answer to your question would be, I have never seen a tool that allows me to change a PDF, a PDF table that, that is complex easily. I don't believe that there's one. Maybe Adam can say otherwise. Yeah, but then you have to create, the idea is that at some point when it's complex enough, you have to create the association between your, pretty much like using headers and ID in HTML. So every time that I've tried it, and again, not really being an expert at all in, in this, but understanding the mechanics of it, I never really got to a point where I could do that and feel like it was a very fluent process. So a lot of things can be done with technology. They're not always very pleasing to do, and that certainly would apply in this case. Yes? Yeah. 
it's it's very subjective really it, it really depends on you if you feel like it brings any it, it brings relevant information to the content then by all means describe it if you feel like it doesn't then make it a background image make it an artifact instead and, and nobody will hear about it. So it's, if it's really there for decorative purposes, obviously just make it a background image. But in some cases, some images, so take this image for instance. So we have somebody who's on, well, we don't see, see him because I hit him, but behind that table we have a guy there who just climbed that mountain. So we, we're seeing uh, above the clouds a view of the whole thing. So we could determine that th this image actually conveys con uh, information or it doesn't. So and. Depending on how we present or explain our position, we could both be right. So in my case here, I don't even remember what I did, but I think it's just a background image. But th there are no right answers for this. So if I do this, so I, yeah, I described it in this case. But if I had turned it into a background image, and it wouldn't be wrong either, because what I'm talking about here is test PDF techniques to test for, for accessibility. I'm not talking about climbing a mountain in any way. So that information could be considered to be purely de decorative and I would be right also. So it's it's very subjective. So if, if, you, if you have a thought process that allows you to determine whether it is or not, then chances are it's gonna be good. Because you, you would know otherwise. If you have a button, for instance, that, it says, that says download the brochure, then obviously that one needs to be described in text. But if it's something else, then maybe it doesn't need to be. Um, in in the settings of Acrobat, you can set what's in your footer and your header as specific regions, and don't and not have that read to you uh, every single time. So it's pretty much how you do it. I would maybe look to Adam, but he's in the conversation right now. You have to listen to what I'm saying. <laughs> um, running headers and footers. Uh, so you, you can you can you can set specific regions for those in Acrobat. You can pretty much set a, uh, uh, check a setting so it's not read on every page. Yeah, I don't. Okay. Oh yeah. Okay. Hold on. Yeah. Here. Somewhere around here, <laughs> but yeah, is huh? Content. Uh, that's Acrobat Ten. Well, it, it's possible here also in, in Acrobat 10. We just don't remember where that is. But uh, but the idea is that you would you would either need two two ways you would do this. If you ended up having that information into each of your pages, you could always turn all that stuff into artifacts or background uh, because you can turn pretty much everything into background. I talked about turning images into background, but I could turn any of that into background if I wanted to. So everything becomes invisible at that point. So you could always take it out of the of the flow of the content by just creating an artifact out of it. So that would be one very tedious way to do it because if you have a long document, you have to do that every single time. So that would be one way. Um, or or just use that feature where you just select that zone and you turn that into uh, into a header or footer, and then it's not read as part of the content itself. It's read it's, it's read as part of the metadata of the document, so to speak. Uh, so uh, so you don't have to deal with it every single time you you find it. Just like we don't deal with it every single time we change the page to, to continue our reading. Same thing. Well, thank you. Uh, I guess you guys are hungry. I am. So if there's any other question, I'll be happy to answer them later on. Um, and just stop by and say hi, otherwise. Thank you.
Oh, and if you guys wanted to see how I break my document with uh with the 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 the, the reflow thing, I can do it right now. 